Welcome to English in the Beauty of Language. This is Stephen Sharman. Um, I'm back to uh, promote my book, Against the Rising Sun. Uh, I made a video yesterday and posted it on YouTube, and this is my second video on Against the Rising Sun. Today I'm going to read an essay, which was the original basis of the novel I used. Um, this novel is dedicated to Captain William Warner Julius, killed in action in uh, the Battle of Muir in Malaya in 1942, my great uncle. Um, when the pandemic happened in 2020, 2021, I was uh, researching in 2020 uh, an article about Kokoda, the battle in New Guinea between the Australian Army and the Japanese um, force. And uh, when the pandemic happened, I was locked down, I, I decided to write a novel and I looked around for something to write about. And of course, you can't write a novel in a vacuum. For anyone who's interested in writing a novel and never has done, you need a story. You need, and you need as much information as you can get. And so history provides a wonderful uh, place to go. And here I had all these notes and and already written down. So I went for that. So um, this is my first novel, Against the Rising Sun. There's the cover page. That's the cover of the novel. It's available in paperback and in ebook. Um, and um, it's published by Austin Macaulay, UK. It's historical fiction, as I say, available in paperback or ebook. You can find it on uh, austinmacaulay.com. You can find it at Amazon. You can have a look at chapter one on my website, urlnovelty.info. I also read part of chapter one in um, on my previous video. You can follow me on Substack at stevesharm at substack.com. Thank you. So today, as I say, I'm going to um, read uh, an essay that I wrote about this. It's an abridged version, but still fairly long. And also, it's uh, Anzac Day today. Uh, it's the 25th of April, 2023. In Australia, we celebrate Anzac Day. We commemorate the death of our soldiers in war. <clears throat> it's a tradition that comes after World War I, um, what the generation who lived through are called the Great War. It only becomes World War One, of course, after World War Two. Um, up until then, it's called the Great, which is and it's not great. It's terrible, of course. It's a disaster. It's the first industrial war where rapid arms and artillery and poison gas and all these other horrible inventions were able to kill masses of men. Uh, something that people may not know is the reason why there are so many war memorials that celebrate or, or that commemorate, I should say, World War One is because when soldiers in battalions and companies went to war in, in that time, they still sent them in groups of regions and towns. The men, the young men went, in, they fought with their own group, their town or their, their region. And uh, that was great in medieval times because it brought cohesion. But in uh, modern warfare, it's a disaster because whole communities get wiped out get massacred by poison gas attacks and artillery attacks and, and dreadful uh, infantry uh, um, uh, advances. So they stopped doing that. But in World War One, they were still doing it. And uh, and whole villages got wiped out, the men, that is, <clears throat> the young men. And those who survived came home injured mentally, physically. So they after the war, excuse me, they put up all these memorials to remember this societal tragedy that happened. It wasn't just a military tragedy. It was a societal tragedy, like so much of modern war. Um, and old wars too. I mean, the ancient world had plenty of genocides and mon monstrous wars as well, of course. War, even, uh, you know, taking away technology is always a dreadful thing. The Anzac tradition has become enshrined in Australia. It's it's something that I often find my friends from overseas don't fully understand why. Um, it's partly because Australia was a young country when the war happened and so the Anzac legend has become a, a unifying national feature of the culture despite the fact that much of the British Australian traditions of that time the same time were now eroded and disappearing um, the Anzac tradition is meant to be a reminder though of the tragic consequences of war it's not meant to be a celebration of war or a celebration of nation which I think to a large extent is what it's become the epitaph is lest we forget, and that means beware of, essentially, as I said, it means beware of forgetting what happened because it can happen again. But solemnly, it's meant to be a solemn memorial of a terrible 
social tragedy. So unless we forget. On the page in front of you now is the blurb from the novel. That's the back page of the novel uh, where I quote uh, my source for the essay and then thus for the novel. Australia in the War of 1939-45, published by the Australian War Memorial, uh, written by Dudley McCarthy. And uh, this is what Dudley says about the war in New Guinea. The story of small groups of men, infinitesimally small against the mountains in which they fought, who killed one another in stealthy and isolated encounters beside the tracks, which were life to all of them. Of warfare in which men first conquered the country and then allied themselves with it and then killed or died in the midst of a great loneliness. Uh, that's published with the permission of the Australian War Memorial. Um, there's some more quotes in this slide. There's some. There's a poem in the novel. Um, and uh, um, all of that is published with permission of the Australian War Memorial, and I'm very grateful to them for that permission to capture those authentic voices. McCarthy was a journalist, I believe, but he, I believe he's, he was in New Guinea uh, during the war. <clears throat> The jungle warfare in New Guinea uh, and throughout the Pacific tested troops and their support apparatus to the very limits of endurance. Often the test proved too difficult. Once hardened by experience, those fighting men who lived and died in the jungle eventually became masters of their surroundings with the strength and skill required to dominate and defeat their opponents. The jungle changed those who fought in its precincts, perhaps fundamentally. Survival in the jungle requires stamina, prudence and imagination to compensate for the discomfort, disorientation and isolation the jungle imposes on all who venture within. The jungle is a primeval world in which sound and light, heat and damp collide, corrode and corrupt, until all that is left is sensation, fear and uncertainty and McCarthy's great loneliness. There's a map I found on the internet of... Uh, it gives you a very nice view there of the Kokoda track. You can see up here, this is the area in Papua New Guinea um, with Gona and Boona up here in the north and then with with uh, uh, Port Moresby in the south. So you see here, here's uh, Boona Gona. That's where the Japanese landed. They built fortresses in both these areas, which they defended later. Then you have Kokoda over here, Kokoda Airfield, which is a, an airfield in the middle of nowhere. You have Waropi. This is, a, I believe, a wire bridge, and, and Waropi is pidgin English in Papuan for wire rope. Um, it's a wire rope bridge over the river, Membara River. Then you have Isarava here where one of the major battles happened. And in between is Daniki. They don't have Daniki marked on this map, but it would be between Kokoda and Isarava. You have to. You can see on that topographic map how high it goes. It, with every As it gets darker, you're going higher and higher up into the mountain range. You can see in this middle here around Defogia, Minari, how, how high that is. You're right up on top of the mountains there. Um, these are enormous mountain ranges in the Owen, Owen Stanley range. Then you come to where the, the final major battle is Irobiwa, up here, right up in the top of the mountains. Um, from that mountain pass, you can get down into the Goldie River, I believe, this must be the Goldie River, uh, unless it's this one over here. I don't know. It doesn't say on the map. But but I, I suspect it's probably – it may be this one. One of them is called the Goldie River or was called that, and that provided access to Port Moresby, so it may very well be this one here. And, of course, here's Port Moresby down here. Now, in Middle Ridge, this is the final ridge before the descent, and uh, that, that was the Australians' final position, but the Japanese never attacked because they were exhausted by the time they got there. This is the essay now, um, Jungle War, New Guinea, 1942, Road to War. The road to war began in the second half of the 19th century when Japan modernised its economy in response to pressure from the US. Japan's reaction to Western infiltration was the opposite to China's. Imperial China, crippled by pride and corruption, stuck its head in the sand and tried hard to ignore the West. Japan took a different road. After centuries of isolation, the Japanese realised they had little choice but to accept change, and in accepting change, embraced it, at least superficially. Japan's subsequent industrialization was rapid, and within 50 years, Japan was a first-class economic and military power, while China, always the big brother of Asia, remained weak and riven by conflict. Japan developed and matured. The critical moment came when, for the first time in history, Japan was stronger than China. It was this revolution in the relationship between two ancient rival states 
which ultimately led to war. So just to be clear what I'm saying here, that you have this rivalry between these two great countries in Asia going on for thousands of years. But traditionally, China has the upper hand because it's much bigger and it's much more cohesive in that sense. Japan is a smaller state, very warlike, but before the shogun period, divided and fighting amongst themselves. Um, <clears throat> suddenly then these outsiders come and Japan has access to Western technology. The Chinese reject it and say, no, we don't want any of that stuff. The Japanese accept it. Uh, originally, they didn't want it, but, it, but very quickly they turned and said, hang on a second. If we're going to keep these foreigners out of our country, we have to learn their ways and take their technology, and then we can defend ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. So by the 1920s, Japan had a modern military, a modern navy, modern industrial plant making vehicles and cars. They had cinema. They had everything. Virtually everything that was modern and industrial in China was imported from other countries, from European countries. And anything virtually, I believe I'm correct in saying this, most of the things that were built in China that were industrial, like railroads, were all built by foreigners before um, before the war. Um, but in Japan, they were making everything themselves. So they were fully industrialised, not partly industrialised, fully industrialised by the 1930s. Then, of course, the Great Depression comes along and wipes out the economic uh, boom and Japan turns to war, turns back to war, um, just as Germany did. So I hope that's nice and clear. Japan's rulers recognised that China would not remain weak forever, while in the West a new power was rising. This is in the 19th century. The German nation, founded in 1871, at odds with its European neighbours from the start. That means France, really. The parallels between the emerging powers, Germany and Japan, are remarkable. Both heavily industrialised manufacturing nations containing large populations with limited living space. Both nations renowned for their strong work ethic and high pro productivity. And both, both cultures harbouring a dangerous sense of destiny founded on a creed of racial superiority. Japan began attacking China in 1931, following the devastating impact of the Great Depression in 1929. And from then on, there was little hope of peace. Japan's aggression alienated Western allies and outright war with China was resumed in 1937. However, to conquer China, Japan needed access to resources, oil, rubber, tin and food. And for these, Japan looked to the US. This is classic geopolitics. Aligned with Nazi Germany and waging a vicious war in China, Japan offended the US, who imposed limits on sales of raw materials, especially oil. In response, Japan grew more aggressive, and this culminated in a US oil embargo in August 1941. The loss of fuel supplies left Japan no choice but to either attack or back down. The US likely expected Japan to demure, but they did not. Famously, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii was devastated by a surprise attack on 7 December 1941. Simultaneously, the Japanese invaded Hong Kong, Singapore, the Netherlands, East Indies, Burma and the Philippines. Like the Germans in 1940, the Japanese seemed unstoppable. Subsequently, the Japanese High Command re-evaluated their strategic position in a meeting held on 15th of March 1942 and decided to expand the defensive ring of their new one empire to include Papua New Guinea, Midway Island and the Solomons. And these are the three great Pacific battles of 1942, which Japan loses, all of them. Uh, this is 1942 is the turning point in the whole war. Germany loses at Stalingrad. The, the, the British win in Africa and the Germans lose three times in the Pacific. Up until that time, the, the, the Axis forces, the, 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 the bad guys, had all the momentum. Then they begin to lose. Um, the new cordon, this, this new expansion of their empire, would break communications between the United States and Australia. And to achieve this, the Japanese intended to capture Port Moresby in New Guinea. <clears throat> However, their plans suffered an initial setback when the seaborne invasion force was repulsed at the naval battle of the Coral Sea. The Japanese then revised their plans and decided to seek an overland route to Port Moresby, excuse me, by landing in northern New Guinea and trekking across what became known as the Kokoda Track. The beginning of Kokoda. On the 21st of July 1942, the Japanese landed an expeditionary force near Goda Mission. They planned to march boldly over the mountains and capture Port Moresby. Had they succeeded, the loss of Moresby would have constituted a severe blow to the Allies, 
At first, the only impediment standing in their way were the Owen, Owen Stanley Range and one Australian militia battalion, the 39th. Just to be clear, as it says on the bottom there, the, a militia battalion are not regular soldiers. They're part-time soldiers, like what today we might call an army reserve. But during wartime, they they are trained and they act as regular forces. And they don't go home on the weekends. But in peacetime, they train on the weekend and then they go back to being a postman or a banker or whatever. Some of Australia's greatest soldiers in World War II were militiamen, such as General Leslie Mooreshead, um, the great general who uh, at Tobruk, uh, who was the general at Tobruk and who also led the Australians at El Alamein. Um, the, there had been intelligence for some months that the Japanese intended to land on the north coast, and as a result, one company of the 39th was present in the area at the time, accompanied by an even smaller group from the Papuan Infantry Battalion. When the Australian command learned of the Japanese landings, the remainder of the 39th Battalion was ordered to advance across the mountain range and secure the airstrip of Kokoda, then the only airstrip on the northern side of the mountains. Only part of the 39th Battalion managed to reach Kokoda Airstrip ahead of the Japanese. The 39th had never seen combat, though most senior officers had, and the men had never experienced anything like the tropical forests and mountains of New Guinea. The young diggers were dressed in desert khaki uniforms rather than jungle greens. The Australians did not acquire jungle greens until the latter stages of the battle. In their pale uniforms, the Australians stood out, and many were killed by Japanese snipers. When the first battles began at Kokoda, some Australians were at the Niki, where supplies were stored, while others were at Kokoda or forward at Uvi, where Lieutenant Colonel Owen hoped to halt the Japanese. The force at Uvi held the Japanese at first, but were then forced to withdraw. Owen himself mistakenly pulled back to Kokoda, from, uh, from uh, sorry, pulled back to Daniki from Kokoda, but returned to the airstrip the following morning with about 80 men after le learning that Kokoda was unoccupied. Owen had put the airstrip out of action and was unable to receive supply or reinforcement by air. This was a serious error, as supply proved crucial in the jungle battle, and at that moment the Australians were farther from their supply base at Moresby than the Japanese at Gonabuna, who were supplied by sea. Just want to mention that nobody knows why Colonel Owen put the airfield out of order, out of action. Colonel Owen was killed in the battle at Kokoda Airfield. He was the, one of the first uh, senior casualties in the battle. I think he's probably the first. And um, nobody knows to this day. The book, the official history, says very little about it. We can only assume that Owen believed that um, the Japanese would land planes on the field. Other than that, it doesn't make any sense. But he he died, killed in action during the battle. In the days that followed, the 39th faced assault after assault from determined, experienced, and well-supplied Japanese forces. Kokoda was lost and reoccupied more than once before the airstrip was finally overrun. During the fierce fighting, units became dispersed, some lost in the jungle, while others escaped after being swept aside by the enemy. Most were able to rejoin the main force as it fell back to Daniki and then Isarawa. As the defenders pulled back to the mountains, the battalion made one stand after another in a running battle which saw the Australians desperate to contain the surging Japanese, who proved hard to hold and were clearly resolved to scale the mountains and reach Port Moresby. The Australians were told that GHQ in Brisbane believed the enemy advance was a raid to cover the construction of a base at Boona, but it was soon apparent the Japanese had no intention of halting north of the range. The Japanese, commanded by Major General Horry, had by 21 August landed an estimated 13,500 men on the Gona Boona coast, quote, of whom some 10,000 formed a well-balanced fighting group, end quote. These men were experienced, determined, and full of confidence. By contrast, on 6th of August, quote, all companies of the 39th Battalion were represented in the Daniki Usarava area, and the total strength was 31 officers and 433 men, end quote. That's from the official Australian history, which I have permission to publish from the Australian War Memorial. In the weeks that followed, three additional Australian battalions joined the fight. The 2nd, 14th and 2nd, 16th battalions and the 7th of the 7th Australian Division, 2nd AIF, recently returned after distinguished service in North Africa, Greece and Syria. And the 53rd Battalion, another militia formation, which performed so poorly it was sent out of battle 
though the situation was desperate and every trained soldier was needed. On 23 August, a new commander arrived, Brigadier Potts, a highly regarded officer of the 7th Division and commander of the 21st Brigade, was ordered to stabilise the position on the track and retake Dakota Airstrip. Uh, a Gallipoli veteran, Potts was ambitious and energetic and had been assured that adequate supplies were available forward to mount an offensive. But this was not the case. The supplies had not arrived and subsequent investigation revealed the supplies had been lost. Upon arrival at Isarava, Potts found an exhausted and partially demoralised force hanging on to their defences by a thread. The 53rd Battalion, which had preceded Potts and whose commander was killed soon after his arrival, proved themselves unfit and Potts ordered them back to Moresby after relieving them of all their heavy arms. Command actually ordered Potts to send back the 39th and keep the 53rd and Potts disobeyed that order as is his right as the battlefield commander, and instead sent out the 53rd and kept the 39th. If Potts had obeyed his orders and sent out the 53rd, sent out the 39th, excuse me, and kept the 53rd, I'd say there's a very good chance that the Japanese would have captured Port Moresby. As the fresh Australian battalions arrived, companies were hurled into the battle piecemeal, soon exhausted by the nature of jungle warfare. The fighting on the trails through an Owen Stanley rain saw some of the grimmest encounters in Australian military history. The Japanese flung themselves at the Australian positions and were mown down by machine gun and small arms fire, only to come again and again at the defenders with the, while their flanking forces moved off the track and cut new trails. The Japanese preparedness to leave the tracks and cut fresh trails demonstrated their mastery of jungle warfare. It took time for the Australians to learn this sound tactic. Once outflanked, the Australians were compelled to withdraw or face being cut off. The following excerpts give a sense of the intense nature of the fighting on the track. This again is a quote from the official history, which I have permission um, to publish. Quote, Lieutenant Gurk's platoon was ambushed as they moved into the attack through dense and confused country. A burst of machine gun fire killed Corporal Clark. Private Thornton, coolly collected grenades from Clark's pouches and disregarding heavy rifle and machine gun fire, dashed up the slope towards the Japanese positions. He was badly wounded in the chest almost at once, but destroyed several posts and continued throwing grenades until none were left. The Japanese immediately get, began to press forward, but Thornton seized Clark's submachine gun and standing in the centre of the track, engaged the Japanese and halted them. When Thornton had emptied his magazine, Sergeant Morris continued firing into the Japanese. The two saved many lives and were largely instrumental in extracting the platoon from a most difficult position, although it was now cut off from the rest of the company, end quote. Private Thornton later died of his wounds and received the Distinguished Conduct Medal. Thornton's sacrifice was one of many on both sides of the conflict. Now, this is another quote from the official Australian history by the Australian War. Mason's men had taken part in four counterattacks during the afternoon, swaying and surging in bitter defence and counterthrust. In that platoon, acting Corporal McCullum had been the dominating figure. Now, with a Bren in one hand, a Tommy gun in the other, he flailed his attackers from their very midst, covering the withdrawal of his comrades. The Japanese literally reaching for him so that part of his equipment was wrenched off in their hands as he smashed them down. His friends said that he killed 40 Japanese and saved a third of the platoon before he himself came back. And I believe I recall that that gentleman was also killed later in the fighting at Kokoda. At the Battle of Irabaiwa, within sight of Port Moresby, far below, the Japanese took the feature but suffered terrible casualties. Exhausted, demoralised and starving, they were forced to retire. The Japanese did send one scouting party forward to probe at Emitter Ridge, the final spur before the descent to Moresby, but this patrol was wiped out by an Australian ambush. The following day, advanced patrols from the newly arrived 25th Australian Brigade discovered their opponents had gone. The Japanese, for the first time in the war, and possibly for the first time in history, were in retreat. Moresby was saved in review. The performance of the 39th Battalion at Kokoda exceeded all expectations and fortunately, experienced regular troops arrived just in time to turn the battle for Australia with the arrival of Brigadier Potts and his experienced African veterans. 
but the work of the staff at GHQ was less impressive. There is no question today that POTS made the right decision to continue the fighting withdrawal along the Kokoda track. The supply crisis was so severe and the defensive position so precarious that any decision to remain at Isarava would have doomed the Australians and likely resulted in the Japanese conquest of Port Moresby. Potts, however, was relieved of command and condemned for his failure to halt the Japanese. His career never recovered, and though he fought on through the remainder of the war, he received no further promotion or recognition for the vital part he played in the crisis in New Guinea. Kokoda affected several military careers. Potts was first in a series of command changes caused by mounting pressure as the Australian public began to comprehend the danger of the situation unfolding in the New Guinea jungle. General Allen, excuse me, a highly experienced 7th Division officer and leader of the initial pursuit of the Japanese as their retreat from Emitter Ridge began was relieved of command due, due to GHQ's dissatisfaction with his progress in retaking Kokoda. So he was his job was to retake the airfield when the Japanese started retreating. The fact was that even when the Japanese were in retreat, starving and desperate, the Australians found it difficult to dislodge them from their holding positions along the track. And that tells you just how tough the Japanese were. They were tough soldiers. Horrors of war. Now we come to one of the ugliest aspects of Kokoda. As the Japanese retreated, the Australians had no choice but to advance through the old battlefields where the dead lay unburied. It was then the troops found the bodies of captured Australians who had been tortured and murdered. It was also during the pursuit that the Australians discovered the starving Japanese had resorted to cannibalism. The Japanese did not cannibalise their own, but rather targeted the corpses of Australian dead. These discoveries were not rumours or legends, but documented cases reported and recorded by battalion officers and medical staff. There is an overwhelming evidence from China through Southeast Asia and onto New Guinea, confirming that it was a common feature of Japanese military occupation for soldiers to torture and murder prisoners and civilians. As to why the Japanese resorted to such vicious practices, it appears they believed enemy had no claim to human rights and that a warrior should be merciless and ruthless in dealing with their enemies or those who supported him. The Tech Gap. In seeking to better understand the nature of jungle warfare, it is valuable to recognise that the latest weapons of the air and ground wars, such as the tank, the aeroplane and even the grenade, did not perform at their best in jungle conditions. Tanks had no room to manoeuvre and were restricted to coastal areas. Aeroplanes could not penetrate dense jungle can canopies and there were few or no airfields. Grenades, I mentioned, were very important, always are in close combat, but they were difficult to use in amongst the trees and the bushes in that kind of condition. Um, as the American and Australian forces would learn to an even greater degree during the Vietnam War, when a patrol went out in the jungle, they went out alone. It is no coincidence that during the Vietnam War, the helicopter came into its own, an aerial vehicle capable of hovering over dense jungle canopy while depositing or extracting troops delivering supplies or medical aid was precisely what was needed in New Guinea in 1942, but the technology did not exist. Allied forces were reliant upon bush tracks, native carriers, horses, donkeys, and inefficient airdrops from converted bombers. And just to mention there, by the way, that without the native characters, carriers, without the Papuan people helping the Australians in the battle, Australia probably would have lost the Battle of Kokoda. The, the Papuan carriers brought particularly uh, medicine um, up to the, up to on the tracks on their backs. They couldn't bring the medicines any other way. Uh, when I mentioned the converted bombers at this time, when they dropped supplies from planes, they were literally wrapping the supplies in blankets and pushing them out of the plane. So nothing fragile could survive. And indeed, there were even apparently issues with the ammunition. Apparently, sometimes it backfired. Sometimes it was damaged and couldn't be used because of the comp because of the impact of the of the ammunition hitting the ground, being chucked out of the aeroplanes. Fairly quickly, they developed the parachute systems. But in those early days, particularly in New Guinea, where they had so few resources, they were literally wrapping supplies in blankets and throwing them out of the planes. That's what they were doing. The ho and horses and donkeys were almost useless as good as they are as pack animals in almost any other conditions, even the horses and donkeys struggled on the Kokoda Trap because it was so steep and so wet. Um, only the natives 
people, only the Papuan people, really could do it. And without them, we Australia wouldn't have wouldn't have made it. And of course, Australians are grateful for that. New Guinea legacy. The Allied victories at Kokoda, Guadalcanal, and Milne Bay, they're two other battles that were happening at the same time. So these three battles happened simultaneously, with Kokoda beginning first, were a turning point in the Pacific War. The Japanese advance was halted decisively by three Allied forces at three separate locations. Of the three engagements, Guadalcanal was the most decisive, as the Japanese threw the bulk of their resources into this fight and lost resoundingly. That's the Japanese attacking the Americans in Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands. During these conflicts, the myth of the invincible Japanese soldier was shattered forever. Yet the war in New Guinea was overshadowed by events in other theatres, particularly North Africa and Russia, while the Australian Army units fighting at Kokoda and Milne Bay were the first Allied forces in World War II to halt the Japanese on land, just as the Australian garrison at Tobruk in North Africa had been the first to stop the Germans. These are military feats to rival the great battles of ancient times when handfuls of men stood undaunted in the face of a rampaging enemy and stopped him cold. And I, I like to compare Kokoda to Thermopylae in ancient Greek history where a handful of Spartans and their allies stood and blocked the pass of the, the invading Persian army, which was a massive army. And they were eventually overwhelmed. and Some escaped, but the 300 Spartans stayed and died under their king, King Leonidas. I mentioned it in my first video the other day. Amazing stuff. Many Australians who served in World War II believed they were fighting to defend the British Empire, and so they were. But looking ahead, they were also ensuring that a freer and more equitable world would arise from the ashes of the past. The Cold War perhaps robbed or delayed that liberation, but its realisation was assured by the sacrifices of young soldiers too many of whom would not live to bear witness. Thank you. And again, this is, uh, I'm doing this today um, respectfully on Anzac Day, uh, the 25th of April, 2023, um, to, to introduce to you my new novel called Against the Rising Sun. Um, it's available online and it should be soon available in, in, in bookstores. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and lest we forget.